If there was one appointment in the recent days in the West Bengal legal circle which took everyone by surprise, that was indeed the appointment of the Advocate General of the State of West Bengal. Senior Advocate S.N. Mukherjee, who hails uh, from a family having a BJP background, is now espousing the cause of the Trinamool Congress-led government. Senior Advocate Mukherjee is today with us in the Bar and Benches interview series to speak on varied issues. Senior Advocate S.N. Mukherjee has been a face in top corporate law battles such as the 63 Moons Technologies case or the Tata versus Mystery case. Welcome, Mr. Mukherjee, to the interview series of Bar and Bench. So your appointment as uh, the Advocate General for the state of uh, West Bengal um, came as a surprise considering your um, BJP background. How did it happen? Uh, that's a million dollar question, actually. I wouldn't know myself. Uh, so I actually opted out of politics after a very short foray. Um, and that was primarily because of my father being involved with the BJP. Um, I opted out uh, from politics uh, after I think his uh, third uh, third uh, uh, try at the hustings. Right. And uh, I've actually enjoyed very cordial relationships with most uh, political parties. And if you look around and ask, I was probably the only one who in Calcutta High Court appeared for all political parties or on all political issues whenever being requested by a particular group of people or a particular party. So I've off late been seen as more of an apolitical person. And really the contact that I've had with Trinomul has been when there was an alliance in Bengal between the BJP and the Trinomul. So I don't know, I think uh, uh, the upper echelons of uh, uh, government or the political party thought uh, they needed uh, need me. And uh, it's a post uh, when offered very difficult to say no to in spite of all the challenges. So that's, that's all that I have to uh, say on that. Yes, it was a surprise for me as well. But uh, uh, the very fact that it was offered was a surprise. And to many, it was also a surprise that I accepted. But then when I look back, there were actually really one reason for accepting it. Uh, that was uh, my maternal grandmother's uh, desire that or wish, pious wish, uh, that I would one day hold a constitutional post. So uh, I looked at it that way and uh, just accepted it. So there was a bit of emotion there. And uh, I think uh, one can do good for the state also as, as Advocate General. So that's the reason for accepting. But yes, it was a surprise. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, before your appointment as an Advocate General, uh, you appeared for Ms. Um, uh, Banerjee in election petition against Shubhendu Dukari. Did that play a role in your appointment in any way? Um, I don't think so, but it wasn't a surprise that I uh, was requested to, to appear uh, for her because uh, one, it's, uh, it's a trial and uh, uh, I have done trials. Uh, there's the very few people who've done election petitions. I was involved in one long ago as a junior. There are not too many people in the Calcutta High Court who will find who have done uh, uh, election petitions. And uh, I don't know if that played a role because I mean, there was really, um, I mean, it's not yet come to trial. So other than the fact that I was involved in settling of the petition and uh, having a couple of appearances. I, I don't know. I mean, it, but it was clearly a sign that uh, I did enjoy uh, the chief minister's confidence. But sir, are there any dinner table conflicts? Like, you know, you hail from a political family which is affiliated to the BJP. Do you at times find it difficult to espouse cases of the TMC government in any way? On a personal level, I found it difficult to espouse the cause of any government because... Uh, <laughs> So it's not really the TMC. In fact, uh, uh, in the family, I think uh, 
there are you know it's got nothing to do with bjp trinamool i have you know fairly vibrant family on uh, on uh, every issue and uh, but as of now my duty is to defend the state right and unless i find it absolutely you know unconscionable uh, i have to defend the state in spite of my own views but yeah we have a fairly uh, vibrant family on most issues and today with uh, uh connectivity digital connectivity it's much easier to you know get after each other because i have one daughter who's a lecturer in columbia university so she's yeah. you know firing salvos all the time uh and uh i have another daughter who's a lawyer and expects to start practice in delhi um so she's also been uh pretty uh you know vocal on uh, issues and she's in fact worked with refugees as well okay. so so that uh, we have we have pretty uh, lively dinner table or you know daily conversations my father unfortunately is not well so uh, the and he was always a fairly reserved man and would uh, hear the debates at uh, the dining table uh, never really got into anything which was uh, uh aggressive or you know demanded us to look at a situation in a particular way so we've had we've had a fairly liberal uh, upbringing and uh, i think my schooling and college i have to thank for that in a very big way okay um so most uh, political issues in bengal are now reaching the courts uh the post poll violence being the latest one Uh, what do you why what do you think should be the judiciary's role in uh, political issues i think if there is a violation of the law of the land or access to justice being denied um, the judiciary should step in irrespective of whether it's a political issue or not in fact i did argue in that matter before the high court uh, on behalf of uh, certain police commissariats and uh, uh the high court's taken a view uh it's now in the supreme court so let's see what uh, what happens there but yes uh, court should intervene i am i'm all for courts uh, intervening where there is an infraction of the law or there's any form of injustice um so the tenure of justice rajesh bindal as the acting chief justice of calcutta high court stirred up a lot of controversies uh even sitting judges uh, wrote about the alleged uh, violation of court procedures especially in the listing of cases what are your thoughts as a senior member of the uh, calcutta bar i think things could have been handled differently and um uh, justice bindal in his farewell speech did uh, uh tender an apology for having uh, if he had offended people so i think uh, in retrospect you know people do uh, do realize that at times uh you know things could have been done differently so so i just leave it at that uh, uh we were all surprised the way way you know things started um but uh you know every uh, every judge has uh, taken an oath under the constitution and uh it's quite right for all of us to expect that you know judges are human they might make mistakes um but at the end of the day they have to deliver justice without fear or favor and as lawyers we have to you know accept and proceed on that basis and on that assumption but yes it did stir up things but i think uh, uh, we we've survived that so yeah so do you think the master of the roster powers needs to be reconsidered or modified in any way not really i don't think uh, there has been such an abuse as to have a relook at it i think uh, um it's it's been a long tradition and i think it should continue uh, one or two perceived uh, misadventures uh, on uh, being the master of the roster should not uh, uh, ensure that uh, should not lead to the practice being discontinued right so one of the most significant constitutional and political debates in the recent past is about federalism and alleged attacks of the federal structure you know, of the country and bengal has been a central in um, to this in the last 2 or 3 years 
What is your take? Yeah, so if you look at our constitution, I think if you uh, study it carefully, it's not, I mean, there's a lot more powers given to the center. You know, it's not a 100% federal structure as we would like to understand it. And uh, it's not Bengal uh, talking about it over the last two or three years. I, I remember as a very young and impressionable student meeting uh, the then finance minister of Bengal, Ashok Mitro, right. who was uh, uh, instrumental for uh, carrying out the investigation on uh, Sanchoita, uh, telling me, you know, there have been massive inroads into state spas. Um, and uh, he was very conscious about it and raised debates, uh, raised issues, flagged all of them. Um, but the center has been no different. You know, whoever's been at the center has continuously made inroads. Um, though they would profess that they're all for federalism and more power to the states. Um, but in reality, in practice, it's not been so. And the constitution permits it to some extent. Um, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not something which will be expected, so to say. But yes, uh, Bengal is standing up uh, on uh, on federalism, particularly if you know the centre in the past has said, or particular dispensation has said, we believe in federalism. Then uh, Bengal has every right to stand up and say, uh, what you are doing is not. Uh, Power for the course as far as federalism is concerned. I think it's fully justified the stand taken by the, but it's it's possible, you know, in the uh, the interplay with the various constitutional provisions. You know, it's uh, uh, lawyers, politicians, they can use constitutional provisions to their advantage. It's for the courts to check it actually. So do you, do you, do you think in any way the very fact that the central government has numerous investigative agencies um, going against the constitutional mandate of law and order being exclusive to the state and state subject. Is that a problem here? Just drawing yeah, so, so I think almost every uh, central government has utilized uh, institutions uh, to put pressure on uh, state governments where the party in power is not as per uh, the, of the same dispensation. It's nothing new with this particular government. And uh, I think if there was a government which didn't use it, it was that which was headed by uh, Atal Vihari Bajpai. Uh, he, he's, if, you, if you look at his very short tenure, I think uh, the happiness quotient might have been the highest amongst uh, states where they were ruled by, you know, different political parties. There was faith in uh, the prime minister. The opposition also had faith in the prime minister. I think that's very important for us to realize. It's unfortunate that we didn't vote him back to power. But uh, do, do you think that faith has somewhat diminished now or it's the same? No, it's diminished. It's... Uh, Continuously, it's diminished. I, uh, I, uh, I don't think uh, any state which is not ruled by the party who's in power at the center has much faith in uh, the center. And um, it's happened, I wouldn't say it's just the present dispensation. It's happened uh, uh, over time. And, uh, you know, I'd say the Congress used the, let us say, we frequently say the CBI. The BJP is now using the CBI it's, uh, or, you know, other law enforcement agencies. So I, the way I look at it is uh, they're not very different in that sense, but it's not something which is good. Right. Yeah. So what is your take on judges with political affiliations? Do you think, are they able to render justice? Well, the ones that I know, I am sure they'd render justice. It's, but there is a second aspect of it that uh, is the question of perception. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the public should also feel that justice is being done. So in extremely uh, obvious, high-stake uh, political matters, I'd expect the judges actually to just recuse themselves if they've had a political background, which they've espoused... Uh, right up to the time of becoming a judge, you know, 
it's I think it's fair that uh, they should recuse themselves. You know, a lot of uh, people who practice uh, our law would still have faith in them. I, I, on a personal level, I have faith in uh, several uh, judges who espouse a political, who had espoused a political cause to you know render justice in a in a matter which has uh, political overtones right. or, uh, i'd expect that i have full faith in them uh, unless something happens during the course of hearing which would lead me to doubt that but i think in such cases the best uh, option is to uh, you know just recuse but there are now um, days after days of hearings that takes place on recusals itself so even that has become a that 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 according to me at least has um, is is changed since the past two or three decades because if you see in the eighties or nineties the recusal would always mostly it it was always you know uh, the judges would recuse themselves but now in fact there are orders and judgments being delivered even Justice Arun Mishra in this particular case involving senior advocate Gopal Shankar Narayan and um, if you remember two years ago he uh, went on hearing a case for about a week. Um, before uh, he delivered a judgment saying that he will not recuse in the case. So uh, this is indeed a new pattern. I, I don't know if you would agree with me. but Yes, you're, you're right. And uh, in fact, that also happened in the land acquisition matter. Yeah. But of course, there were precedents there that you, the very fact that you've decided in a particular way uh, should not uh, mean that you uh, recuse yourself from constituting being a member of a, uh, of a bench. I think uh, Sham Diwan had argued uh, yeah. argued that matter. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, recusal should actually on several matters should come from the judges themselves. But uh, you know, uh, the trust between bar and bench might have also diminished over the over the years. You know, it's perception which also keeps. Uh, working and uh, quite often uh, lawyers are far more vocal outside court these days than they were when I started out. That's because the, uh, there is uh, um, so there are so many outlets where you know you get to speak. I am speaking to you today. Actually, I've in the past actually what given three interviews. I've, I've stayed away from it uh, consciously. But uh, since you uh, were fairly polite about it. I said, yes, <laughs> many others are not. So, um, uh, so in, in that context, uh, do you think collegium system is the way ahead for appointment of judges? Well, I had a very long uh, discussion on this issue uh, with uh, the late Soli Sorabji, who was also involved in, uh, in the matter. And he had expected uh, the Vires of the Act, the NGAC Act, to be upheld with a little bit of dilution, so that the judiciary would, uh, uh, or the judicial side would have a clear majority in the decision making. Um, so, but that's not happened, and. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Justice Rumapal has gone on to say that uh, it's one of those uh, uh, bodies where, uh, you know, the transparency wasn't really the hallmark. Uh, these comments resulted in, you know, who's rejected, who's been put through being announced. Um, but as of now, uh, yeah, the collegium system, uh, if the appointments are made quickly, uh, would work. And it's something certainly which we cannot leave to the uh, the executive, or uh, the, there's no way. Right. It has. We have to find a, uh, find a uh, alternative if need be. But the executive can't have uh, a say which uh, uh, can override the say of uh, let us say the uh, the judiciary in choosing. Right. So, so my view is the constitution actually didn't uh, expect the judiciary to have the final say on the interpretation, but that's settled by our Supreme Court now. What is your take on that? Well, that's been decided. I mean, it's been decided time and again that in consultation is the primacy, the uh, 
the, you know, the view of the Chief Justice has, the, has primacy. So uh, that's the interpretation of, uh, of the Constitution. But I don't think it was meant that way. But I think that's okay. how it's worked out. And uh, it's not done too badly. Uh, in fact, a lot of Supreme Court judges would tell you that there is no other alternative. I remember discussing this with Justice Bharucha as well. But uh, I think uh, uh, there has to be more transparency in this, in the sense of uh, really the public knowing more about the persons whose names are being put up. Uh, and uh, But it's, um, I think uh, as things stand today, uh, it should work. It should work better than any other mode with the NJAC having uh, not survived the test of uh, validity. And uh, unless something else comes up, let's see. So you're known uh, for your expertise in commercial and um, corporate law matters. What, according to you, ails the current corporate law scenario in India? It is, uh, unfortunately, uh, not what it should be. Uh, one of the most important jurisdictions today is uh, actually dead, and that's shareholder actions. Uh, it's kind of given away to insolvency uh, petitions. There no, it's very difficult to get matters heard which involve charges of oppression and mismanagement or uh, relating to uh, rectification of uh, register of members. Um, and it's sad because shareholders today, it's a very important jurisdiction. It's been a minefield uh, for, uh, uh, you know, the exercise of uh, equitable jurisdiction in commercial matters, uh, in corporate matters. And that's taken a complete, uh, uh, you know, backseat to uh, insolvency petitions. And uh, uh, sadly, uh, you're not getting many judgments here. And that's one of the most important jurisdictions. But sir, um, you know, there have been a lot of um, um, inauguration centers of international arbitration centers in India. Chief Justice of India, Envy Ramana, recently inaugurated one in Hyderabad, one in Telangana. Uh, but still, you know, when we peruse these international arbitration deals, etc., most of their centers are abroad, whether it's Hong, uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, even if it's one of the uh, Indian uh, you know, corporate giants involved. Why is it so? Why are still not Indian seats of arbitration uh, you know, becoming popular? Well, Indian seats will certainly become busier because, uh, uh, because uh, there are going to be government departments who are now insisting on seat being India. That's number one. Uh, several governments are actually disillusioned with arbitration and uh, just getting rid of that clause. But uh, the seat abroad, I think uh, it's because there is more discipline in the hearing and uh, uh, dates are given and matters are heard. And uh, conversation over tea and coffee is uh, minimal. So you actually get, if commercial uh, litigants are in, uh, are in dispute, they prefer the dispute to come to a quick resolution. Uh, with a final verdict. And there, I think the centers have uh, uh, been uh, fairly disciplined. And uh, the secretariat is geared for, uh, uh, you know, dealing with complicated uh, commercial matters, because now almost every commercial deal is layered in such a fashion that it's a complicated set of facts and documentation, which uh, has to be dealt with. Correct. And uh, because it's institutionalized so well uh, in these centers that people prefer these. So a little personal question now, um, which especially, uh, you know, uh, are read by the younger readers of Baron Bench. Uh, how did you take up law? Oh, almost by default. <laughs> so I, uh, I'll just give you a brief, brief background. So I did my schooling in uh, Calcutta school called St. Xavier's, St. Xavier's till class five. Uh, then I went off to uh, Dehradun and read at the Dune school where I did my ISC 12. 
and uh, then came back uh, to Kolkata and did a degree in economics in presidency. Uh, managed, surprised everybody by managing to do pretty well. And presidency those days was uh, a much vaunted uh, college to be in for uh, economics honors. And then I actually joined MA in Calcutta University for about a year. And I was thinking of going to the US, had started applying, had uh, got some admissions, and uh, which were funded. And then my parents, both of whom were barristers, uh, said, why don't you have a look at law? So they said, well, you apply to just three or four places. We are not asking you to apply all over the world. If try. So I deferred my admissions for a year in the US and uh, I got into Cambridge and I went there, read law and loved it actually. Uh, there were, there were you know, clear answers on several issues, unlike in economics as where, you know, uh, theory and practice didn't, wasn't always fitting in. And uh, then I did the bar, again, did uh, embarrassingly well and then came back and, and started practice. So law was never in the horizon. Uh, in fact, I'd sat for entry to the Indian Statistical Institute and walked out within 15 minutes of the examination because maths was based on West Bengal Uchyo uh, Madhumik math standard, which IAC didn't match. <laughs> and uh, I kind of had options in IIT and AFMC, AFMC because I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then uh, settled for presidency, which I loved. I mean, it's one of the best places to have done my undergraduate at that time. So uh, having procured your law degree from Cambridge, uh, if you look back, and especially when you see the younger crop of lawyers, maybe your juniors, interns, etc., what do you think needs immediate attention for the legal education in India at the moment? So luckily, I've had uh, 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 interns who've been exceptionally bright. In fact, uh, much brighter than many students I encountered in Cambridge. And uh, uh, I think legal education uh, is doing pretty well with the national law schools, a couple of private institutions. Uh, but I think that the teaching now needs to become more interesting. When they were, when the schools were set up and the modules, the national schools here, I'm talking. When I did law, I mean, if you didn't get into anything else, that's when you'd think of enrolling for law after a master's. I mean, that's what it was. It was a kind of last resort thing, and it's glad to see that it's you know first choice for many youngsters, and several of them are phenomenally bright, and. Uh, I've had tremendous assistance, but I think, you know, when I look at how they're taught, I think uh, when it started out, it was excellent, but I think the, um, there has to be more innovation in the way, you know, uh, uh, youngsters are taught law. And uh, I think uh, there has to be a push, not towards just a safety of getting a good job in a big law firm, but also it sh should help people make up their minds, uh, you know, in a positive manner about litigation. You know, it's been a deterrent because for the first few years, you, a youngster won't be earning much unless, you know, he has some kind of patronage. Uh, I think it's the duty of our senior advocates to, you know, provide stipends and look to get in uh, bright people into litigation because that's really where the action is, according to me. And so my last question to you as we race close to the 30 minutes mark, any advice to the younger lawyers? Yes, so I put it to the three pieces of advice that I got from very senior lawyers when I joined the profession in Kol Kolkata. One is the most important attribute to have in this profession is humility. And that's in very short supply today. Uh, number two, I think is to be fair to the court and fair to the opponent and make a fair presentation of facts to the court. If the facts are bad for you, it's better to 
you know, tell the court that and yet argue the case, saying that maybe in law you have a point or, or take advantage of the fact that you made a full disclosure to, to ensure that the exercise of discretion against you is not too harsh. And uh, the third is there's no substitute for hard work in this profession, particularly if you're in litigation. And particularly if you're leading a team because you cannot hide. And the fourth, I, uh, I, I was reminded of, there's a, there's a fourth piece of advice as well. Never underestimate your opponent. Very important one, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so that will that'll be all. I think it was great speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon.